Oh, welcome back to Roast Mortem, the only show that Mike is currently on probation for. Oh, no. He's done. He's done for a week. Uh Okay. Where'd he go? Where's Mike? I don't know. I'm Tom, though. I'm Spaghetti Worm. Travis. I am your Cody for the evening and substitute Smooth Brain. Cody's stepping it down a bit, making it good. Can't wait to lose off that brain. Careful, no slip shoes. I'm pretty excited for this episode. I did a bunch of research. Nice. I don't think people realize how much research we put in. Yeah, we it's do a more lot of than reach. none, which yes. is, uh, most podcasts do none. So. Uh, so I was talking to my neighbor, and she woke up one night, and it was spooky, and then we got drunk. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's uh, every other podcast. Yeah, that's every Every other right. podcast is like, what could possess you to think that the nothing coming out of your mouth is better than the nothing that's already in people's heads? Am I right? Yeah. yeah. Um, it's it's either stand-up comedians, true crime, or Gary V telling you you could do something that you certainly can't do. I actually think there's a lot going on in my vapid brain. Vapid. Yeah. What are you, <laughs> filling in for me? Because I'm filling in for Mike? Yeah, well, precisely. I'm a Cody. Uh, look at me. I'm going to eat a Spam Misubi. <laughs> Spam Misubi. Right. All right. Now we're entering into nothing territory, which we <laughs> just described as being not acceptable. I mean, all we right. Go, well, we how go is ass ever- deep in, Yeah, we have to how go ass deep into nothing territory. Oh, all right. I like how we start the show with nothing again. Um, yeah. I'll get Always. mine over with this time instead of lamenting. I have had a hell of a week. I, I've been working on this studio. I've been trying to uh, step up my game here, more podcasting and audio equipment that I'm not going to list off because I don't want to be robbed. And it's been a nightmare getting everything set up. My new job is killing me slowly. I, nice. I'm real fast. Real fast. I mean, real fast, slowly. Yeah. But uh, right. interesting stuff. I, I like the work, but. Ooh. Ooh. Spicy. I- uh, I mean, Tom, either you joined a black metal band and you've been painting your nails, or it looks like you got a little boo-boo on there. Like your nail's about to fall off. Hey, what is this? Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's electrical tape from... Oh, from... okay. You're working. Right. Working yeah, hard. You're Me working like on the, the system, the thing. setup. If, you, okay. if you're watching this right now, you can see sometimes I'm going to be turning my head uh, to your left. No, my left. And uh, <laughs> it's been... And I uh, got another <laughs> monitor over there. I got a monitor I'm working on over here. I'm just doing so many monitors, brah. Hell yeah, brah. I'm tired of this nice. one monitor life. I don't want to be a one monitor slave anymore. <laughs> Cody. I, mean, I, I have multiple monitors, but they're in different rooms because I'm just too lazy of a bastard. Like, I, I got one in my bedroom. I got one in my living area. And I just, like, shuttle my fucking computer between station to station. I, I tried to take one of my monitors I had already and put it on my desk in front of my other big monitor and put that one up a bit. You know, give it a little, <clears throat> oh, come on up here, buddy. And yep. I was like, well, they don't make stands that lay back as much as I want. So I started building oh, one out of wood. Like the pitch? Yeah. Mm. I started building one out of wood, and it was going really well. And then I was like, well, this monitor I have already kind of sucks. So now that I got the go. stand, let me upgrade the monitor. A little higher yep. resolution, all that. So I get that in Amazon, and I go to ho- put it on my custom stand that I've spent – Hours making ow, hours, and the inputs are too high to the bracket, so I can't plug anything in. So I have to literally take my my hard work made of yeah, wood, your trophy, and I throw it. I, I brought it out to the driveway and I threw it on the ground, and that's where I am now. <laughs> in the driveway. I'm uh, well. Yeah, just add this. You might know some sweat and uh, electrical tape yeah. on your fingers. Mm-hmm. Oh, fucking mess. Uh. Cody, Sorry, what did you, what did you throw in the driveway this week? Uh, uh the Christmas tree, actually. <laughs> just out in the driveway, you didn't bring yeah. out to the curb. Just like fuck that, we're done. Yeah. This can this can rupture my tires later. Do you guys grow Christmas trees out there? Yeah, and it's and it's very noticeable because you look at it and you're just like, this isn't right. Yeah. <laughs> like if, if you're like. Six, eight feet away, you're like, yeah, it's a Christmas tree. But like, when you're actually touching it and taking ornaments off, you're just like, oh, this, this tree's been eating spam or something. <laughs> and it's like, all you, right, brother, this you, is uh, how you. It, it, it's wrong. The needles feel wrong in your 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 hands, and it's just like it's got gummy it's very, pine. 
Yeah. yeah it, it's, it, 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 even if I was watering it and not creating a living fire hazard in my house, it feels dry. The needles feel like weird and not sticky enough. Well, to Cody, be, like, maybe next time you shouldn't uh, put it in water that is not water, but in fact Diet Coke. God, I love that stuff. <laughs> Just wanted to put some pep in the tree step. But yeah, I'm going to blame the sea tortoises. <laughs> Those bastards are the reason we don't have fairies on the state of Florida. Well, they're the reason why you don't have Christmas. Real Christmas and real Christmas trees. Yes. I, I don't know uh, where that logic is. I don't even uh, want to follow it. It's pretty simple, dude. Mike would be high-fiving you and nodding it's, along right now if he was here. It's vapid logic. Oh my God. Vapid. <laughs> Man, all right, Travis. I know. What did you do? What did you? Uh, I bought hentai this week. Uh, okay. How much? I bought hentai from a dead man's house. Oh, <laughs> that took a left turn. I'm I'm suddenly intrigued now. Yeah, no, I went to the. Did sustain- he die from the hentai? I I went to this estate sale, and it was a very like Christian household. There was like loads of like religious books and psalms cool. and shit yeah. like that. And all of a sudden, out of the corner of my eye, I see some little Kanichiwa language in the corner. And I go skirting over there. <laughs> and, uh, Did you break right. into this house? I, 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 sorry, I'm, I missed how you gained access to No, this it was house. an estate sale. Oh, they so let them like in. They let them in. Okay. They let just oh, yeah. anyone in. <laughs> Anyone's allowed in. It's very, yeah. very desperate didn't... times for these So people. I see some Japanese comic books, and I was like, Ooh, okay. I pick one up, and I was like, there's titties all over this. Open it up. Full on hentai. Getting blasted yeah. by robots, by dudes, robots, come everywhere. And it was like 40 of them. And so I was like, dude, I'll buy this whole box. Because, like, they're all from, like, the, like, 1990 and 1980. Were, were they, like, um, wow. yeah, you, you can have that box. That's, that was actually the garbage. <laughs> no, they said that was the, uh, I'm assuming that this was like somebody's in-laws or like maybe a son or something. Like, uh, yeah, okay, I yeah. don't know, but he was like, this... "Yeah, there was four boxes of that in the basement," and I, I we were there the second day, so I got the last box. And he was like, "Yeah, I've been usually charging, you know, like two dollars a pop for them. I'll give you one for each." I looked up the price of these things; they're like forty bucks, fifty bucks. Really? Congratulations! Yeah. So you uh, made yeah. out like a bandit. Yeah, I, and I get to some... look at some cool comics before I sell them. Yeah, just don't just wash your hands before and after, because you're gonna sell them <laughs> yeah. to people, and no, and the value will decrease if uh, Travis comes on them. Uh, Arguable, actually, do, do, do maybe our Patreons want first dibs at these? Oh, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, that'd be interesting. All right, we'll make a Patreon post asking if anyone wants to buy some hentai from Travis. Yeah, this, <laughs> with Travis or without buying- come. Get yeah, to my hand. Come optional. Come optional. <laughs> it's a good title, subtitle for this episode. Uh, <laughs> Travis's um, hentai buying ventures give me a, a great idea to do a, a prank. Like, it, just imagine like showing up to like a geriatric, a, a recently deceased geriatric person's estate sale, and you just smuggle in like the dirtiest sex toys in your trench coat, and then pretend you found them in the house. That's good. Oh. So you just, you just like walk in, go in the basement, and just bring up a sex swing that you brought in with you. She's like, how much for the sex swing? And then just look <laughs> at the terrified like granddaughter's face. <laughs> That's a really good prank, actually. I like that. Reverse robbery. Yeah. <laughs> you're paying you're paying twice for the same sex swing. Yeah. But you you're you're getting those dividends back in the horrified expressions of the recently deceased woman's granddaughter. So. It's entirely worth it, especially if you buy the sex swing and the dildos and butt plugs secondhand. Yeah, because yeah. then you're saving money. Or and you, then... you just go dumpster diving for it. You know what I yeah. mean? Like some some dildos go out of style, and you can find them in the back of, uh, you know, Lexington and Steel Incorporated. But a dildo is like a Twinkie. It's always good. Yeah, and but with they go that out of style. And with that, Tom, I want to talk. Who's about Who's on the, the choppy boy? All this dildo talk yeah. has made me not want to talk about that. A plus segue. <laughs> yeah, right? Uh, so today on Roast Mortem, I will be presenting the story of Stevie Ray Vaughan. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. I have no idea who that is. Cody, I know you're not much of a music man, but I think you'll be able to connect on uh, with him on a few levels. 
Um, he is one of America's finest guitar players and performers. Hands down. Great stuff. We're not talking shit about his playing. Great, great stuff. A staple in the blues rock scene. This man blew people's minds with his soulful passages. Licks so heartfelt and heavy mm. that the show attendees had a nasty habit of leaving his concerts and driving right to their exes, kicking down the door and yelling, Susanna, why'd you run off a cooter, huh? What's he got that I ain't got? We work at the same gas station. Uh, yeah. It's emotionally provocative. I, you really start thinking. Yeah, you know, I don't know if that would be my reaction because... You told me who we were doing today, and I just been listening to Stevie Stephen Raymond Donovan, Stephen Raven Vonnegut yeah, all day. Okay. Really worth that for you to say that. I've been listening to Stevie Ray Vaughan all day, and I've just been really hungry. I want ribs. It's like it reminds me. His songs either remind me of eating barbecue, or like what a dog, like the soundtrack the dog has in its head. What just any dog? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He does. He does have this very um primal thing going on with how he plays and all. Uh, somewhat of a dog. He's a goddamn legend, though. And he's worth talking about. But on top of being a legend, he's a, a, a weirdo. A real weirdo. So mm. he'll fit right in. Yeah. So just like Travis, he's weird. But mm. <laughs> but slightly more memorable. So we're going to get into him, see what makes him tick. Oh, what? <sighs> I can tell you what makes me tick easily. So can he make? Can he tell what makes him tick? I don't think so. Could he do that? Dead. He could probably just play guitar. What can I do? He's I dead. can use my mouth. I'm a mouth artist. You are a mouth artist. <laughs> Hate that term and how much it's caught on since you invented it, Travis. <laughs> Memorable. Anyway, Stevie Ray Vaughan, born October 3rd, 1954, in Dallas, Texas, to mother Martha Cook and father Jimmy Lee Vaughan. Mm. We don't know that much about Martha other than she was a sturdy woman. Who could yes. take a hit or two when Big Daddy Jim got too drunk? Ah, he was playing that that uh, that the Mama Bongos. Yeah, the Mama Bongos. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. You kiss your mother with those fists. Nobody said that rhythms can't be violent. No. Big Jim was a top-notch bumhole. His father had died when he was young, and he enlisted in the Navy when he was sixteen with the help of his mother, who forged documents saying he was 18. And yeah. thanks for your service. <laughs> when he came back to Texas, he got into the asbestos installment game, which is a great way to die. <laughs> Perfect way. Cody, uh, you want to yeah. start an asbestos business with me? I know it's kind of not in fashion anymore, but I like being itchy, dude. Itchy's the new style <laughs> like, of being like fresh. Be <laughs> Good yeah, to be and cool. Guy's retardant. Guy's so cool looking. He's itchy yeah. and fresh. Uh, but yeah, uh, he actually didn't do that for a while, but it is a good way if you're into that. Um, mm -hmm. he stuck around yelling at his family and being a total embarrassment, not one to run away. So he's got that going for him. Much like myself. Now the first version of Stevie came out March 20th, 1951, and his name was Jimmy Ray Vaughn Jr. All right. No, Flash Jimmy. Copy. Excuse me. I got to correct that. Jimmy Lee Vaughn Jr. So we had a older brother in the picture. With a similar name, and we'll find out they have similar interests. Did the older brother, because he's named after his father, come out of his mother's vagina and just give her a black eye? <laughs> <laughs> Pop down. Yeah. Come on! Um, wow, that fetus is very limber. <laughs> yeah, Martha could fight back too. Oh, so he just so she would just punt punt the fetus across the room. Yeah. Get you hit me! Here. Get out of here! Oh my god. Big Jim had to move the family around Texas a lot due to his union asbestos job. Ah. Uh, when the boys were young, they rarely spent more than a few months in a town before being uprooted and put in a new school. Shit these are sucks, all different man. these are all different Texan schools all over Texas. So, okay. So they're they're fully armed going from school to school. Yes. With yeah, their there's a lot of amendment. A lot Safest of good schools. guys with guns. Finally, when Jimmy was 10 and Stevie was 7, the family settled down in Oak Cliff, Dallas, Texas. Oak Cliff was a tough area with lots of muggings, and everyone who lived there had a saying, which was, hey, don't get mugged. <laughs> yeah, all right. I can see that. It's kind of uh, like a McGruff, the 
anti-crime dog. It's true. Everything PSA. I just said is very true. Was that on um, their town sign? Like, welcome to, where was this place? Oak Cliff. Welcome to Oak Cliff. Don't get mugged. Yeah, well, well yeah. it was more of a saying. Ah. Uh, it's one of those things that just, I suppose, brought comfort. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's not anxiety-inducing at all. S- Southern comfort. Don't get yeah. mugged. Now, who said that asbestos and music don't mix? Probably no one. The same uh, yep. year they moved into their house, the boys received their first guitars. Big Jim knew a bunch of musicians and was cousins with a few professional swing and rock and roll players. Oh, nice. Music was always playing in the house, perhaps mm. to drown out the sound of violent, drunken madness. <laughs> it does do that. Uh, what, what music are we talking about here? Yeah. For Dallas, it was a bit of country. You would think all country, but they were pretty versatile. You know, a lot of Chuck Berry rock and roll and uh, blues, big blues in the family. Mm. So Big Jim would bring Jimmy and Stevie to country shows, jamborees, and any other concert that would let you bring your children to. (laughs) Uh, The musicians that were friends of Big Jim would come by the house and spend time with the boys. Eventually, Jimmy and Stevie were jamming with those very same friends. I thought you were going to say Jimmy and Stevie were molested. Uh, no records I mean, of that, but th- yeah, this is very. This is the late fifties, early sixties. So, one of these kids may have been molested. <laughs> There's no joke well, there, Travis. Well, like, hanging well, around the rock and roll crowd, you never know, you know. Yeah, yeah sex, like, drugs, rock and roll. Yeah. So they were they were ingratiated into this lifestyle of music, and people come by the house, and you had to play an instrument, and they loved it. So Jimmy joined his first band when he was thirteen, called the Swinging Pendulums which is a name only idiots would call their bands. I was going to say that sounded cool, but fine. <laughs> well, pendulums only do one thing. Yeah, it's fine. They, sw- they swing. Yeah. So to say the swinging pendulums is like naming your band, I don't know, the writing pens? The ticking clocks? The yeah. long-necked giraffes. It's <laughs> a good one, Travis. The Long Boys. So the Swinging Pendulums were managed by none other than Big Jim, and he would book them for shows and bars and make it a family affair. Steamy. St- I'm going to keep calling him Steamy. Steamy. <laughs> Steamy Ray. He's Steamy Ray Paul. The sexual little rascal. Yeah. Stevie had his first taste of playing in front of an audience at the age of 10 years old with his band of other housebroken Texas friends called the Chantones. They were Shant- using the swinging pendulum's gear and decided to play in front of some adults. That's nice. All right. yeah. Sure. Housebroken. Jimmy then moved to his next band, Sam Loria and the Penetrations, which has a really <laughs> nice ring to it. <laughs> One more time? I missed that. Sam Loria and the Penetrations. Uh, oh. <laughs> you know what that was? That was like a band being like, let's call ourselves the Penetrations. And then Sam was just like, that's not going to work for me. All right, we'll be the Penetrations. You be Sam, Lord. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the boys were fully ingratiated into the uh, Bacchanalian lifestyle. They what? were basically destined to be animals. They were familiar with all the doormen at all the clubs they played. And those uh, guys would let them in at any time, mostly through the back door. Well, I mean, they were penetrating into the clubs. Yes, there's the joke. Uh-huh. Yeah, there, yeah. there it is. They weren't allowed to drink, but they did anyway, of course. Mm-hmm. They stole other people's drinks and had a uh, had, had swarthing groups of gullible imbeciles buy them shots. This was nothing new to Stevie as he started stealing liquor from his father as early as six years old. Oh. Uh, How? How do you do that? Oh, I get Texas. All right. Yeah. I, 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 did I tell this story on the show before about the first time I got drunk when I was a baby idiot? Yeah, I need to talk to your mom to verify this, but tell it right now. It's fun. Oh, well, uh, I remember I was at my great aunt's, and she used to pre-mix uh, gin and tonics like in her fridge because she drank a lot, uh, uh, and she would okay. pre-mix them in a Sprite bottle. <laughs> and so I went not in, label it, I presume. Yeah, we'll label it with just Sprite. So I went into the fridge... Poured myself a big glass of Sprite, which was actually J and T, and then it is J and T for everyone listening. We call them J and T's. <laughs> gin and tonic, wrong. yeah, J and T. Tonic, yeah. Wouldn't that be G and T? G and T, a G and T. It's a J and T. 
J and We've T. Been over this. J, like I was saying G. I was going J and T. J and so, T. Yeah. So I J, drank. It's a J and T and a Tim Collins. Yeah. <laughs> so I drank all my Sprite and I was wasted. I was like, mommy, bad Sprite. And then I was like <laughs> throwing up in the other room. And I was just drunk at like six years old. So me oh. and Stevie we get along. Yeah, you guys would be we, great friends. We could probably he, both tell the blues and stuff and play guitar just as good as him. You just need Sprite and gin. Tom, I never picked up any of your guitars because I don't want to embarrass you. I appreciate that. I could use <laughs> a little humbling from time to time. And <laughs> not that much. You're a good friend, Travis. So anyway, he's making cocktails with Kool-Aid and whatever and hanging out with the cool kids. Both Jimmy and Stevie played guitar obsessively well. They were into blues like Albert King and Muddy Waters and rock acts like Cream and Jimi Hendrix. Nice. Stevie only had uh, one job ever and consistently needed to borrow money throughout his entire youth. And he'd also borrow gear from the local music store. So it's like, wait a minute. Wait, you're drinking and doing cocaine and you're not even paying for any of it? Yeah. Hmm. I think we found yeah we found the big problem right here. What was his one job? Uh, he was a dishwasher, and what happened was he was washing dishes, and he slipped when he was moving from one place to another, and almost fell into the deep fryer. Uh, <laughs> and, the, and the boss was mad at him because uh, he he almost broke the deep fryer. <laughs> Steve was like, "Fuck this, man! I'm gonna play rock and roll." And you know what? It kind of worked in his favor because he God was just him. handed shit for most of his life. I mean, I feel like they're, everyone went to high school with at least three of those guys, but they didn't make it as big as Stevie Ray Vaughan did. Yeah, he got lucky. Yeah, he got lucky. Now, Jimmy found some minor success playing in bands with enough income to move out at the age of 16. People consider Jimmy to be one of Dallas's best up-and-coming musicians. To Stevie, his older brother was the best guitar player in the States. Nice. Mm. Gee, if you, gee, if you like my sound, you're going to love my older brothers. <laughs> there was a bit of that happening. Uh, Jimmy did have a successful blues career for himself, too, but his voice is not as good as Stevie's. So, like, yes, people know who Jimmy Lee Vaughn is, but right. he never blew up. He never got that legendary status. So that's further down the road. And, in fact, it took a while for Stevie to stop being so shy to sing. So a lot of Stevie's early musician uh, bands and stuff like that, he was just the guitar player. Stevie was an awkward kid, didn't have a lot of friends, but used his older brother's musicianship credentials to hang out with cool older people. So did he get in with the cool older people with the music credit also? But he's like, guess what town we're in right now? What city we're in? Dallas. You know that is backwards? Salad. Bam! I'm in with the cool kids. Too many L's. This kid's good, Cody. <laughs> <laughs> he joined a band called Liberation as a bass player. But as soon as the band saw him play guitar during one of the practices, they swapped around the members and made him lead guitar. Very nice. good at a very young age. So this is also when Stevie started getting into speed. Oh. oh. Stevie loved speed. Like anyone else who tries speed. <laughs> <laughs> because speed is great. I can imagine. And he liked meth because meth was great. They're designed to make you feel really great. And because of speed, Stevie was able to forget about everything and play guitar for days on end. Oh, yeah. That's what the Luftwaffe did in their planes. Yeah. Man. yeah. Just, <laughs> let's put it this way, man. It's just one way to conquer. <laughs> Through the power Here's of guitar. Yeah, perhaps Jimmy should have taken more speed and he would have been more memorable like the younger Vaughn brother. <laughs> Stevie, had, <laughs> Oops. Stevie had somewhat of a compulsive practice routine. He'd play along to records over and over again and try to emulate the other guitarists perfectly. He wouldn't just learn the riffs. He wanted it to be identical. He was really, really in tune with his ear, looking at microtones. Those are the little notes between the notes and oh. trying to get them bands perfect, you know? He didn't even know music theory, but he was so obsessed with learning all these little techniques physically that, that uh, you know, that's, that's why we got uh, this guy. I think if anyone goes out of their way to learn music theory, I think that disqualifies them from being a great musician because it just proves your head isn't on, your, your head is more type A than B. You know what I mean? Um, 
It's like you, that's not how an artist should approach it. But I don't know. I, I, that's I don't that's know. actually a conversation I've had with musicians who know music theory. And yeah. there's this school of thought with these theory heads mm-hmm. that wish they didn't learn theory. I, I, I just see like music theory as like clamping like and standardizing the practice of making music and it becomes formulaic instead of unique is my sentiment there. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I think that Mozart said it right where there's only seven ways to skin a crab. We did the Mozart I don't know if episode. he didn't say that, Travis. He did. He say never that. said that. I did the research for that episode. He never said that. He said that. You told no, me. No, I didn't tell you that at all. It was off camera. Absolutely ridiculous, Travis. All right. There are seven ways to skin a crab. <laughs> you know, crab right. skin is the most tender part of the crab. You've been eating crab shell. Have you? <laughs> <laughs> no. You don't it's know a what skin, tender means. Dude. Where do you think the bacon come from? All right. Enough of this shit. So I'm Stevie confused. dropped out of school a few months before graduating, as winners do, and started yeah. a band called Blackbird. He eventually Blackbird moved to- swimming in the dead of night. That's the one. Take my broken legs and teach a tree how to swim. <laughs> Got it. He moved to Austin with his new group, and uh, there was more of an appreciation for blues music there, so it was a nice place for him to be. They got a residency gig at a blues joint called the Rolling Hills Club. Ooh. He opened up for some semi-big acts that I never heard of. <laughs> um, so that's okay. And his <laughs> bandmates had a hard time with his childishness. Uh, uh, do you guys have I a hard time with my here. childishness? Uh, Check your emails, Travis. You, 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 you <laughs> scream into your microphone sometimes about raccoons. Uh, well, you know what? Uh, well, I was going to say something topical, uh, right? You ready for something topical because I've been listening and paying attention? Cody, have Never. you been paying attention? I mean, it's music, so kind of. Cool. So he's in Austin. Tom, you've been to Austin. They yeah. love Stevie Ray Vaughan there. Yeah. And I remember I went down there. There's like statues of them. And then you go to that oh. street that they close off every Thursday through Sunday. And everyone's playing Stevie Ray, Ra- Ray Vaughn at the same time. Oh, all just yeah. like pumping out of different clubs. Mm-hmm. So it just turns into like a Stevie cacophony. A cacophony? Yeah, a little cacophony. Isn't that how you a say cacoph- it? A cacophony? cacophony. Cacophony. <laughs> whatever. A- vapid. Cacophony is the world's most uh, sexual instrument. <laughs> Cacophony. Uh, mm. Yeah, it's yeah. played with your scrotum. So anyway, uh, <laughs> so Blackbird, back over here. Uh, Travis, you're absolutely right. They like Stevie Ray Vaughan a little too much. Too much of a uh, of a bad thing will be annoying. Uh, I'm they still be- in awe. You said cacophony. I'm still recalling. Dude, it's a cacophony. That. Whatever, cacophony. Right. Sorry, Tom. They would meet up at the rehearsal spot. At twelve to go to a show, and it was everyone knew. Hey, we're gonna meet up at twelve so we can go to a show. Nice. And then everyone will be there. Come twelve thirty, where Stevie wouldn't show up. They'd call him, but his phone bill was rarely paid, so someone would have to go over to his place where he would be waking up. He would take <laughs> his time, shower, invite them in, then has to oh, be driven man. to the music store. Even though everyone had gone to the music store the day before, he would borrow some strings and picks from the local vendor. And then be asked to be brought to a hamburger joint. <laughs> and while he was there, he would ask to borrow $5 for food. And then he'd be ready to go to the show. <laughs> Very Perfect. late. Yes. Uh, usual occurrence. Eventually, he quit that band because he couldn't get a solid lineup and joined a band called Cracker Jack. But they sucked, so he quit very quickly. Did the Cracker Jack band, did they dress up like the Cracker Jack kid? I don't even know if there's recordings of them, but uh, mm. one oh. of these bands, I forget which one, wasn't Cracker Jack, but one of his like 10 bands that he was in before he blew up, uh, the band leader made him dr- dress all weird, like wear le- le- leotards and a stupid hat. So that's and- Cracker Jack. There you go. Yeah, let's just pretend it was. Yeah. And then the guy, the leader of the band actually fired Stevie Ray Vaughan because he could see his wallet in his back pocket <laughs> and he wanted to just see the, the flushness. I don't know. These people are huh. sick. You're ruining your rump. Stevie was still very young at this point. Even though he's been in a few bands, he's still uh, like about 20, 21. He's trying to find his way. And uh, part of that is like identity stuff. So he becomes a terrible dresser, as a lot of people were at the time. Perfect. Uh, uh, Because that's identity. He 
What? He's like, this is like the 70s right now? Yeah. Yeah, miserable dressing. Horrible. Very, very bad stuff. Uh, he it. tried to accessorize like his favorite players, you know, like Clapton, Dwayne Allman, Hendricks, hodgepodge of bullshit that never looked comfortable. Uh, lots of scarves, dumb, cheap hats, stupid sunglasses feathers. made of garbage, feathers, uh, feathers. A- anything else he could wrap around himself. So he was that weird ass dude. Um, he also hated that he wasn't black. Ah, uh, one of one of one of those psychological complexes. Yeah, him and Jimmy were so into the blues and felt that the best blues artists were black. And that they would never be considered one of them. Oh, okay. <clears throat> to be honest, he was already a fantastic player by this point and on his way to being a legendary guitar player. So that was kind of, yeah, he didn't have much of an ego about it. Let's put it Got that it. way. So he tried okay. to fulfill it in other ways. He was really good. He didn't see himself as that good, but he was crushing it. I, I mean, he had a, he was born again. He was saved from a deep fryer. Born into the world. Oh, it's kind of like a reverse a baptism. Player. Instead of going into water, you avoid going into the burning oil altogether. Right. That's right. The, the, the moment Gee. that you realize you could have been a chicken McNugget and that life is has much more to offer. It's precious. Yeah. Virginity and cocaine. Um, <laughs> MSG. His famous gunslinger look that everyone knows him for didn't come into play till much later. That was a... Uh, that really started in the mid '80s. He's such a rough and tumble Texasman. Yeah, all right. It's one of those looks when you when you look at Stevie Ray Vaughan, you look at pictures of him, or you look at videos of him playing. Um, you're like, oh, this kind of badass. But then you start picking apart what he's wearing, and that his pants are made of pool tarps, and <laughs> oh, I see. And his jackets don't really fit, and his hat has like, uh, you know, it's just one of those big sun hats with. Like a raccoon tail hanging off the back of it, you're like, this is this isn't great either. I always thought that way about Meatloaf too. He dressed better than Stevie Ray Vaughan. Not great. He did, but it always looked like something that you bought at like Halloween Depot. Yeah, oh, one like of if you're okay. trying to dress as the Phantom of the Opera, but cool. Like he took the he took the cowboy. Fa- costume pack and the Phantom of the Opera and just mix them together. Yeah, I see I what like you that. mean. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, Travis. Uh, I mean, Cody, you don't really know what clothes are. No, I don't. I I know what green and shirt mean. Yeah, and I just got these two pairs of jeans that uh, I just trade off whichever one's stankier. I am really glad that for someone who doesn't know what clothes are, that you've chosen things that do work in a lot of occasions. Yeah, pants work, shirts work. Yeah, uh, that, that that's what, like one of the things. It's just like if you don't know what you're doing, you just keep it simple, stupid. Yes, don't because don't, because don't try to strap a ruler to your head. No, 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 I wouldn't do like the the unicorn ruler approach because it's too far out of my comfort zone. And hmm. the the thing is, like every so often, like the way fashion just goes, it pretty much it might swing my way every now and then. Just like oh, minimalistic, I can do that. You have a very 1998 look. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's probably like, why everyone thinks I'm recently graduated from high school. Whenever I meet them for the first time, they're just like, oh, hey. You look like Weezer from the Pinkerton. Yeah, Weezer mm. is my spirit animal. Let's get back into this. So um, Mark Benno of the Nightcrawlers called up older brother Jimmy one day in 1973 and asked him to join the band. And Jimmy said, no, your band is bad, but my younger brother will do it. And if you call him right now, I'll tell him to do it. <laughs> so this right. happened. So Mark Benno called Steve Ray Vaughn and he said, hey, you want to be in my band? And Steve's like, I don't even know how you reached me because I didn't pay my phone bill. <laughs> That's... And, and then Jimmy calls him up and goes, hey, that offer you got, you got to take it. So he joins that band. Um, this gig was pretty terrible. Stevie and the band flew out to Hollywood to record an album with A&M Records. After the production of the album, it was rejected entirely by the record label, and the band left Hollywood, leaving Benno behind as well. They mm-hmm. signed with some weirdo as their manager named Bill Ham. Yeah, yeah Bill Ham! Now, Hamm. hold on, hold on. I know what you're thinking. Now, when I say Bill Ham, yes. the name Bill is not short for William, but is in fact short for Billy. 
Ah, yeah. Okay, ah. I get it. <laughs> South, they do that. Yeah. So instead of Billy being Richard, you'd be Ricky on your birth certificate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so... Uh, Ricky Bobby. Him and Bill Ham, Steve and Bill Ham's relationship was a little rough because Bill Ham put a bunch of money up for him to do this stuff, and none of it panned out. So Stevie technically owned Bill Ham lots of money until the day he died. <laughs> oh. Anyway... Bill Ham did a terrible job booking and promoting the band and left them high and dry in Mississippi. Now, in mm. 1975, after quitting the Nightcrawlers, Stevie got his first taste of success in joining the band Paul Ray and the Cobras. There's too many uh, cool band names that are almost cool. Like, yeah. It, it's a weird like ratio. Like you said, like the swinging pendulums initially sounded cool to me, but you you talked sense into me. I, You're welcome. I think every fucking <laughs> name has like every band name you you've laid down initially has that knee jerk reaction, like oh that's cool. Do they have jackets? I want one. And then you're just like, wait, no, the the, the penetrations. I don't. I don't want that jacket. <laughs> I don't want to wear well, that. Yeah, you're right. And Cody, I understand or, that you thought that was pretty cool. I mean, you are. Doing substitution smooth brain. I'm trying. Evening. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying. Yeah, you're trying. You keep bullying me about how I say cacophony. What do you say to that, Cody? Go eat soup off of a bowl that's upside down. I like I like the cut of your jib right there, sir. Yeah. Very smooth. That was meant uh, as an no, insult. What? Uh, what? Uh, well, I always hate when bands do like something, something, and like a guy's name and then the other dudes. Like Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, or you know what I mean, like. But that's what old-fashioned bands did because it used to be all about the band leader. So the the yeah. the Cobras w- could be a rotating door of people, a- right. and the band leader is oh, this guy okay. Paul Ray. That's why they did that. So it's flexible for a rotation to happen with the non-leader. Right. Yeah. So they had a pretty decent-paying residency in uh, Austin, and toured around a bunch in his second year with the band. He was easily outshining his bandmates in the Cobra, and they were considered Austin's premier music act. Uh, So they began to write more pop-oriented music. Uh Stevie uh wasn't into that. He was into the blues. So now that Stevie was well-known in Austin and Dallas for his playing with the Cobras, (laughs) Stevie decided to leave them and make his own band called the Triple Threat Review. That's horrible. Triple oh. Threat would be great, but they just they just ruined it with review. It's like it's already passé. This is the Triple Threat or review. Yeah, sounds old timey. So they they called themselves that because there were three lead singers. It was Stevie W. C. Clark, who was a well known musician, great blues bass player, and Lou Ann Barton, who was okay. <laughs> All right. Lou Land Barton. Now, this also was a mess because he would take gigs the day of, and the band members oh. wouldn't find out about it until a couple hours before. Oh, A lot fuck. of the times, they wouldn't even make it. Uh, Stevie would sully his reputation uh, as a, a solid musician and became known as a flaky wiener. Yeah. Yeah, that was rough for him. This was also the time he, ne- he met Lenny Bailey. Okay. Um, now, any of Stevie Ray Vaughan fans might know that name, Lenny. And it's not from The Simpsons. It was a woman. Uh, and he fell in love with this Lenny Bailey character. And they mm-hmm. were two crazy cocksuckers or something. I don't know. Um, uh-huh. <laughs> they were into drugs. So this drug-addled couple How, uh, were way too similar to be together. They were blues hippies, which is way better than drug-rug-toting college hippies, but still yeah. filthy individuals. So it's just drug rug college hippies, but they eat barbecue because they're in Austin. That, that's pretty good. Yeah, something like yeah. that. Weird uh, picture. Like they're not like they're not like don't kill the cow. They're like let me get in that cow. Let's have sex in that cow after it's dead. The two would fight and, and do speed and coke all week long, <laughs> and they uh, they couldn't really afford it. Stevie was a professional <laughs> couch surfer for most most of his adult life. A yeah. total mooch. A goofy vagrant, if you would. And now he had someone to beg and borrow with. Lenny was the kind of woman to tell all Stevie's friends that they needed to watch how much coke he was doing. Keep an eye on that guy. Make sure he's not getting into too many drugs. And then she would go and spoon feed him coke until his nose bled. Yeah. Ah. I need to give him drugs. 
Yeah, she was off her fucking rocker, man. And nobody in Stevie's life liked her at all. But Mm. she was there. He did, however, write some really nice songs about her, like Lenny, which is a woman's (laughs) name, Lenny. Creative. Oh. (laughs) This is one of Stevie Ray Vaughan's best songs by far, but if you know the woman, it's... Bullshit. (laughs) Got it. So one time, while Stevie was on the road without her, she brought her car to the auto shop to have all the snakes removed from the floorboards. (laughs) How many of them were in there? Well, now I know what you're thinking, guys. Tom, this is Dallas we're talking about. Could have been a southern copperhead in that car. Yeah. Could have been a western diamondback in there. Yeah. Could have Rattler. been a couple cotton mouths floating around inside the floorboards. Maybe a few Texas corrals found in there under the old hoopty. Yeah, doing some cotton eye Joe, a bunch of snakes wiggling around. Right. And if you're thinking like that, you would think, well, why didn't Lenny take the car to animal control? Yeah, that was my first. They uh, know, take it to Pep Boys. Right? They know how to deal with snakes. And cars, too, probably. Not Jerry, the auto mechanic. He doesn't know anything about snakes. And as it turns out, the whole time, she was just using drugs and was so high (laughs) that she couldn't tell the difference between animal control and the auto mechanics. And there wasn't even snakes in the car to begin with. Hey! That was was my overwhelming question that was burning. Just Stevie's Stevie's there eating spaghetti, like spaghetti, and it just falling into the driver's seat. Just like, oh! She's like, get them snakes out of here! (laughs) Now, see, I appreciate this drugged up level of hallucinating snakes, but being sentient and cohesive enough to at least somehow arrange for problem solving to happen. It's not the streamlined yeah. version of problem solving. It's just she was she had her mix just right where it's just like too many snakes in my car. Let's take it to the shop. Right. And she <laughs> operated a vehicle and drove yep. it to a shop. Yep. Yeah, let's be real, though. In, like, Texas, there's not a lot of buildings to hit. She probably wasn't driving on the road. She's probably just driving through the deserts. Yeah, probably. Through Through the dessert. Yep. Yeah. Anyway, Stevie loved this dumb bitch for some reason, and the two got (laughs) married between sets that he was playing at a club. Oh, lovely. And he used Ah. rings made from juicy fruit bubblegum wrapping. What? 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 (laughs) Well, you see, rings cost money. Yeah, and he doesn't have any. Right, and money could go to drugs. Yeah, ooh. Yeah. Ooh. Okay, I see their dilemma there. This right. makes see, perfect that's sense. That's pretty sweet of Stevie. That's super sweet. Right? We're Very it's sweet. like, I'm thinking I'm thinking about you, honey. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to get you a ring. We can do more drugs. Exactly. And I, I just want to take this opportunity to, to mention that with a lot of the people that I bring to Roast Mortem, I don't think I would be able to write any ridiculous scripts if there weren't drugs. So, hmm. I, I mean, I love drugs. God bless them. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, keeping us together. Anyway, back to the old uh, triple threat. Uh, I don't know. That bad name still sounds like porn. Yeah, triple threat review. It's not a very good name. It hmm. sounds like porn, but it's got that daily review guy in it. Who's that? That like guy that wears the suit. He looks like he's 13, but he's probably like 20. Oh, that guy. Burgers, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, he's yeah. all right. I mean, I blocked his channel, but he's all right. <laughs> it sounds like one of those, like, naked news stations. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, it sounds like a podcast of three men yeah. reviewing threesome pornography scenes. Can we do that? That would be a really good podcast. Can that be our bonus episodes? I'll see if Just... Mike can take my place, but then yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, Play uh, by play pornography. The triple uh, triple threat, they played around for a while, and the people of Texas went wild for them because they had chemistry. Makes you know? sense. And like I said, there's no band leader, so uh, they're doing their thing for a while, and then all of a sudden Stevie starts singing more. He gets comfortable with his throat, and he's like, oh, uh, <laughs> you know, oh, no, whatever. I, that's not how he sounds, but you understand. Sure. So he's making the sounds that Blues Traveler makes with the harmonica. Yeah. Except out of his mouth. Out of his mouth. Mouth artist, <laughs> right, Travis? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh God. Yeah. Stevie was the reason people were coming to the show, so it made sense that he started singing more. He's like, "Hey, uh, this is it." 
It's him and his loud amps. Did I mention that his amps were always really loud? No. No. Some would say too loud. Really? <laughs> yes. Interesting. Uh, anyway, he got the idea in his head to tell Luann to hang back in the green room when the band started and to come out when he called for her to make a bit of a spectacle out of it. Like, oh, and here's the other member that just sings. <laughs> okay. And uh, this, they did this for a while, and for sure it would, they would start a set, they would do a song together, and then she would come out. And eventually, Stevie would push this time back and back to the point where they would have these three-hour sets that were from 10 to 1, and he would call her out at, like, 1245. <laughs> what a dick. <laughs> yeah. And here's Luann yeah. to, to, to do some Stepmaster class on the stage. That's cool. Yeah. So Clark left the band because uh, I think he was a respectable man. And Luann <laughs> did shortly after. And Stevie started Double Trouble, the band that he would be best known for. Amazing. So, so he went from triple threat to double trouble? Yep. He uh, downgraded yeah. because there was a threat before. Now it's just trouble. Yeah, yeah, trouble is. I thought you were going to go with the numerical thing there, Travis. But the, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, no, no. threats are bombs. Trouble is kids eating Snicker bars and not cleaning up after themselves. That's trouble. N okay. Yeah. Double trouble because it, it was now a three piece. So it was it was kind of like Stevie Ray Vaughan and Double Trouble. Mm. But uh, yeah, after some lineup changes, the band was officially comprised of Stevie Ray Vaughan drummer Chris Layton, and bassist, as well as professional criminal, Tommy Shannon. Oh, <laughs> how professional. What year are we at now? Are we out of the 70s or? Yeah, we're at, I think we're in like 81 now, 82-ish. Mm. Okay. See, I always thought Stevie Ray Vaughan was earlier, but I guess my timeline's all off. So also keep in mind, like the music that he was playing, there wasn't a huge market for it. Because right, like, there was all these great players, Albert King, B.B. King, Muddy Waters, that were doing this stuff, and there hadn't been anyone who grabbed anyone's attention in a while. So there was, the audience was like, what, what's going on here? So they worked really well in right. Texas, but, you know. Yeah, this is like Van Halen times, right? Like And like White Snake and shit. Yeah. Yeah, so think about that. I mean, this is old old man music. So, Good stuff. So Layton, uh, Chris Layton, the, the drummer, he was a good pick to have in the band because he seemed to have an understanding of business and, in general, how to operate. Um, Tommy was a criminal who was good at bass. <laughs> yeah, okay. I buy it. All right. So once Stevie got caught doing a line of blow by an off-duty yet seemingly nosy officer of the law, this is while he was opening for Muddy Waters. Well, you can't be in jail while you're opening for Muddy Waters. No. You can't do that. So mutually also, exclusive. Yes. Nosy, cop, no, nosy coppers usually do your line yeah, and then arrest you. It's not like this guy, I, I read this article and it's like the guy was off duty. Why the fuck does he care? What do you Everyone care? was he doing care? cocaine at this point. Everybody. Yeah. It's like what you did uh, before you went to church back in the 80s. Exactly. All right, all right, honey, it's time. Get in the minivan. It's time to go to Sunday mass. <sighs> right off the dashboard. Right. And now without Chris Layton in the band, the only guy who f figured out how to save any money whatsoever, he had to spend all of his savings and get Stevie out because Stevie never had any money. Well-known music producer, who I talked about on the Aretha Franklin episode, Jerry oh. Wexler, caught Double Trouble Live and was knocked off of his ass. Huh. Ah, this is the Jewish man from Brooklyn? Yeah, I mean, Jerry Wexler. That's how you remember Jewish, him? yeah. Um, yeah. He reached out to the organizers of the Montreux Jazz Festival in Switzerland and had Double Trouble put on the bill. And this is when the magic starts happening in Stevie Ray Vaughan's life. They had two gigs at the festival. The first set bombed as it was a hmm. terrible lineup decision, booking this rowdy blues band sandwiched between two acoustic jazz acts in a room full of beret-wearing cheese-filled Twinkies. <laughs> gotcha. I can see. There was a mixed reaction couple boos really up in his face but that really hurt stevie because he liked to wow the audience mm -hmm. but the next night he played the montreux ca casino venue to a much more receptive audience in that audience was famous singer songwriter jackson brown and human-sized stick bug david bowie oh good <laughs> oh. description 
Very Wait, nice. so yeah, I mean, that uh, you feel like this rowdy blues guy is going to fit in way better at a casino where there's titties out. Yeah, dog. You know what I'm saying? Like, he's there, he's got his fucking feather hat on, and, oh, no, Lenny, Bruce, you're what up, I love you. Oh. Oh. <laughs> it's worth it, right? You're dying for yeah. your art, just as Stevie Ray Vaughan did. Um Jackson Brown offered his personal studio to Double Trouble, which was in California, to record their album Texas Flood, free of charge. They were able to pull that off in two days. Initially, it was just supposed to be a demo session, but first album comes out of that. Pretty nice. Sweet. There you go. David Bowie, while talking to Stevie at the old Montreux, asked if he would like to do some session work and implied that he wanted to take Double Trouble out on the road for his upcoming tour. So after the recording of Texas Flood, Stevie met up with Bowie. I forgot where, but it sure as hell was in Texas. No. This is magic out of ground control. Yeah, that's Have the one. Boy. That guy? That's the guy? Yeah, that's the guy. Can we um, roast that boy, Major Tom? I'd love to. Actually, there's a uh, there's a little shade happening in this episode for him. Maybe there's a little preview for you. So I don't pay attention. Oh, oh tapas. Oh, yeah. yeah. Little tapas. So Stevie helped record some parts for Bowie's new album. Let's Dance, <laughs> including the uh, solo at the end of that very single, Let's Dance. Uh, this, okay. is, this is how Stevie became familiarized with the music industry, and people became familiar with him. He was very easy mm. to work with, a lot of reputable producers getting good word about this young blues player who could shred. Mm-hmm. Just give him some coke, he's happy. Yeah, he's fine. I mean, that's um, true for yeah. all humanity. Yeah. Yeah, it really got him out there, but Bowie did a pretty dick move leading Stevie on thinking that he was going to tour with Bowie and double trouble. See, he wanted Stevie to tour with him as a session player in his band, and Stevie had told the other guys in the band that double trouble was going to go open for Bowie, which Bowie did Uh. say to him, but never contractually. So now we got Uh. Chris Layton out in Austin, Texas, leaving messages with Bowie's people, trying to figure out what the fuck's going on, with very little correspondence back. And then the eventual ghosting. Besides being under the influence 24-7, Stevie was also under the impression that he would be playing backup for Bowie as well as his own set time to open the show. So Stevie was practicing away with Bowie's band, ready to do his session work with them. And when Bowie's management starts chipping away at Stevie, i.e. giving him some rules of conduct, Stevie smelled some fish. There was, hey, uh, no talk of double trouble to the press, okay? And Stevie's like, oh, that's my band. (laughs) Yeah. Are they going on tour? Are we going on tour? And then all of a sudden, uh, hey, you're only going to be on stage for a couple songs, and uh, you, uh, you're going to have to get off. Really, you're only going to be on for there for two songs, three songs, because hmm. Bowie can get whoever he wants, you know. So yeah, and then, and they're like, hey, guess what? You're going to have to wear tights and paint your face with a lightning bolt on it. I hate that. Yeah. Uh, so and at- then this text, this Texan's like, I have to do what? I have to do what? <laughs> what, what? What tarnation? What, what, what did you say to me? Um, at, yeah, like any Texan who you tell to put paint on their face, they're gonna go, that's asinine. Yeah. <laughs> Unless it's for a football game. Yes. Yeah, yeah, the only exception. So after consulting with some of his friends, Stevie said, fuck Bowie, and left his band. Now, that's a smart move, but nobody knew that at the time, because no one had ever done that with Bowie before. And Bowie was not happy. It was a bit of uh, headbutting in camps for a couple of years. They did end up uh, probably kissing in a closet later, but <laughs> there was uh, some, some rubbing there. But this actually added some bad boy mysticism to Stevie's lore. Do, do you think that they lady and tramped a line of coke? Uh, like they both started started two ends snorting and then like they meet in the middle and their noses touch. Oh, what you got to do is it out. You got to put your tongue. You got to put your tongue up the other person's nostril. Yeah, so they like have a, a seal. Yeah, yeah, you can wipe it clean. You know, help them out. <laughs> but yeah, no, this is a weird thing because this is this kind of helped put Stevie Ray Vaughan on the map. They're like, who's the fuck is this guy who ditches David Bowie? And yeah, Stevie wasn't really bothered by the ordeal himself. Everyone was like, "Oh man, you're crazy," and he's like, "I'm just doing cocaine. Please leave me alone." <laughs> There's a difference. Um, it just seemed like a natural choice to him. The only time it seemed to really sting Stevie was when he was in a bar and saw the terrible music video for Let's Dance for the first time. At the end, he sees Bowie doing some stupid dance, holding a guitar, all weird and awful, oh, wearing uh-huh. some white gloves over Stevie's solo. Yeah, that's bad. Uh, 
<laughs> Give it a watch if you haven't seen it. A lot. I don't think a lot of people know it's Steve Ray Vaughn playing the solo, but it's very funny watching David Bowie kind of stand there like a filing cabinet, like, this is how I am. This is what is right. I'm making this music now. David yeah. Bowie, I am the most original man, prolific artist ever, and I will call my song Let's Dance. I'll say it right now. We might have some fans that, well, we don't really have fans, but we might no. have some listeners um, who are ready to tell me that I'm wrong on this one. But David Bowie was hit or miss. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I feel like there's a lot of artists like that. Yeah, but people worship him. Do you remember how? Do you remember uh, how they sh- they shut down the the stock market when he died? Did they? No, no but it felt like it. Oh yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> I feel like that's just been happening for ten years. <laughs> it just keeps happening. Guys, uh, don't you remember 2017? That was a rough year for all of us when all those people who were supposed to die died. Oh, yeah. my God. Double Trouble was signed to Epic Records in 1983, and Texas Flood was released the same year. Woot. Yeah, hell yeah. Fuck yeah. Woot, indeed. Yeah, they would go on to release five more studio albums. Couldn't Stand the Weather in 1984. Who's Soul names? to Soul in 1985. In Step in 1989, The Sky is Crying in 1991. <laughs> it's just rain. And In the Beginning in 1992. Uh, Those you, names. Yeah, pretty bad names, right? Yeah, you know what they say about Texas? There's only rain and cows. One yeah. of them is an animal that makes rain that's white and is tasty. Yeah, suck my white rain. <laughs> The band had lots of success, and they were the nation's premier blues act for the better part of a decade, yada, yada, yada. <laughs> I don't want to hear the good stuff, Tom. Yeah, I know. All right, let's get into some more fun stuff about Stephen Ray Vaughan. When Couldn't Stand the Weather came out, the music industry took them very seriously. I don't know why, because anyone who met Stevie Ray Vaughan could see that he was quite goofy. You see, Stevie thought of himself as a businessman. He, in fact, was not. (laughs) At record label meetings with Epic, he would ask them for money so he could hire doctors and engineers help him develop his patented light therapy chair. What? That's so fucking 2020. Tell me more about it. (laughs) Uh, Wait, he's making tanning salons? No, no, no. Hear me out. This is way better. Yeah. Okay. Stevie was a huge believer in light therapy, which is oh. nothing like these solar lights that helps seasonal depression. I kind of buy work. those. those yeah, work. They, they work. Stevie thought of uh, that different color lights would be able to heal any ail- ailment if calculated properly. Uh, what do you mean if calculated properly? Well, you know, maybe you, you look at your hexadecimals. Like, you know, you open up your Photoshop, you got all uh, those hexadecimals. FFs. Got it. Yeah. Okay. You find that perfect hue, and then you shine it on your kneecap. All of a sudden, your dick's hard. Dude, favorite uh, hue, hashtag 69699. What is that? Uh, one? I don't know. I don't even know. Should so I open look it up. my photos up? <laughs> no, you can just look it up. You can actually just type it into Google. Yeah, I'm sure. All right. Report FF, back, Travis. 69699. A little racist how black is just six It's red. It's red as fuck. Ah, it's red as fuck. That and makes that, sense. It's very light red. That's the description. That reminds me of when my face is near something that's light red. <laughs> wow. Stevie wasn't the kind of guy to take no for an answer, but he was credulous enough to be satisfied with many, many empty yeses. <laughs> that just fucking hit me in my giggle dick. <laughs> like, I will not accept no as an answer, but maybe's. But 24 maybes will suffice. Yeah, yeah he, he was like, he was staunch about these decisions and these things he wanted to do, but you could just tell him you'd get around to it, and he'd be like, all right, man, you're the best. Um, that's like, and, I feel like that's a very... Never te- follow up. That's a very Texan schedule. Yeah, y'all, I'll get around to it. Later. That's true. Gotcha. He always wanted to be an inventor. Uh, wow. That's why he invented his SRV light therapy chair, but no one ever heard of it, nor was it actually invented. Um, <laughs> of course. He, 
He invented he he sketched up rockets that he wanted to build or amps that he wanted to play out of that had no volume knobs because he hated when people asked him to turn down. <laughs> oh, you could just break the knob off of a regular amp. And... Yeah, I mean, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, uh, he I don't know. He wasn't really that smart, I guess, because he would. Yeah, very specifically detail these amps out. Like, you know, here's the here's the speakers I want. I want to use these modules. I want these tubes and stuff. And the front's got no controls, just on and off. Yeah, no and controls. You, pl- you plug innovation. in, and it says on the amp, it says, turn up or fuck off. Yeah, yeah, the <laughs> fuck off button, like, blows the amp up on whoever just touched it. You don't, des- you don't deserve it. He really sounds like the Dan Aykroyd of vodka. You mean oh, yeah. the Dan Aykroyd of blues, as Dan Aykroyd is already the Dan Aykroyd of vodka? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, he does like vodka, and he likes aliens. I like Dan Aykroyd. Yeah, but you know that he perfectly engineered that crystal skull uh, to line with the chakras of the world? Yeah, dude. No you got to drink he's the got, truth. He's an inventor. He's, you can drink the truth if you drink out of a skull that's sick, especially if you're wearing... Uh, premium Ed Hardy shirt. That's very true. Oh, wow. So it was strange that he was obsessed with the idea of healing people with light therapy, let alone anything, because he was so self- self-destructive. self During the mid-80s, everyone around Stevie was doing loads of coke, but he was still that one guy who the other cokeheads thought had a coke problem. Oh, that's no good. To have a coke problem in the 80s. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cokeheads are telling you you've got a co- Wow. And... It was, it was Crown Royale, cigarettes, and Coke. And just to be clear, this is not that clean rock star Coke that they would pick up that give you that nice pep and then you get the okay kind of uh-huh. come down. Mm-hmm. This was like dumpster Coke that was mixed with speed and would crack a septum in half after a weekend usage. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Strong stuff. Yeah, some, he was big on nosebleeds. Yeah, this is some Texas wall, bomb, wall, wall bombs Coke. Yeah. Ooh. By the time they were recording Soul to Soul, the entire band were straight-up coke fiends. Yeah. They would meet up at the studio, play ping-pong until the drugs came, and then that was usually very late, and then they would start to record. That's if Stevie didn't have an inkling to do some weird sound experiments, like fill a snare drum with packing peanuts, or put coke cans under the bass drum pedals. <laughs> oh, he's one of those experimenters. I see. Yeah, I and he... See. he and as proficient as he was with his guitar, and he was very good at getting solid guitar tones. That was really important to him, and he's he's known for having some of the best guitar tones out there with okay. the Strat, Strat kind of Fender Bassman tone. Uh, when it came to the other instruments, not so much. You know what I was going to say? Because I listened to, Steve, like I said in the beginning of the episode, I listened to Steve Ray Vaughan pretty much all day. Yeah. And the only other tone that I will say is perfection in most of his songs is the snare song, a snare thing the snare sound in the all snare the sound yeah, yeah it's snare. always like bah, 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 yeah bah. <laughs> yeah chris layton was a great drummer who really hit fucking hard when he he had to he just loves just that fucking... snare dog yeah and they recorded everything live and this was during the time when they started doing single track recording and they were just old school they uh, it was always just sessions in a room where they would record a few times the same the same song and pick the best one um which is cool. Yeah, so I like, I'd, say, I'd say, Chris, great snare. I'd say you're probably the king of snare, of one snare. Of the single snare. Of yeah. a snare. Now, Stevie had also developed a really nasty habit of fixing the gashes in his fingertips, which he, he had a lot of because he, Imagine. Would, he would bend the strings so intensely. Uh, he would fill these gashes with baking powder and super glue. Mm, it was uh, a... Uh, what? Yeah, he'd mix up this concoction and pour it in the little holes in his fingers... And then he'd file it down so it wouldn't get caught on the strings. Now, this worked well enough, but he needed one more thing to really pull it off, which was skin oil. You know how, like, you you, uh, put your your finger on your face and you feel that oil? You need that. That's a a life hack we can do right now. If you ever have too much foam in your beard, rub your nose and then put your skin oil on the beer foam. Uh. Yeah, that was uh, Travis Bro talking. That's yes. yeah, that's yeah. the college Travis. <laughs> college, speaking. Fred Trav. So my name's actually Chaz, but I go by Trav. So he wanted his finger, his fingers on his left hand, to be oily all the time. 
Okay. To okay. kind of keep keep that shit in. I don't know. It worked for him for some reason. Uh, because his face was so dried out from doing all this cocaine and being seriously dehydrated, uh-huh. uh, he would just rub his disgusting glue fingers on his bandmate faces yes. when they weren't paying attention. Oh, no. I love he, it. Yeah, but he was like, it was gross, but he was also like the lovable goof throughout mm. most of his life. So, like, you'd be like, Stevie, what the fuck, man? And he'd be like, oh, sorry, dude. <laughs> oh, d- just- Lenny! Just trying to, to to siphon off your essential oils off your face. Yeah. <laughs> I'm surprised the other bandmates had face oil if they were also doing the cocaines. Well, he was doing the most amount of it. And yeah. he would use the little that he had. You know, he'd be rubbing around. And sometimes nice. it was engineers and sometimes it was other people. Sometimes it was fans. Yeah. I mean, if you've seen um, footage of him playing, uh, they're actually the really famous thing of him playing it came out in 1999 brendan fraser's in it and it's the mummy Shut up! Stop. it's Shut the up! mummy you know when the the sandstorm's just, coming in and it's opening just, its mouth just that's stevie ray vaughn's <sighs> face it is so dry it's made out of sand and scarabs all right bad bad well, travis that was no, that was a I real have to talk about it all right fine whatever so like I said, he's hard to deal with at times, but overall, he's a real nice dude. No one ever held anything against him. And he was engaging with conversation, especially with the other musicians. Talented weirdo, awful teeth, looming stench. <laughs> okay. Yes. Not really an asshole. Just throwing it out there. Yeah. Right. Also, watch some interviews with him on YouTube. Each one of them is like watching a different person. Because of all the drugs and weird shit that he had oh, going through his okay. system. Like where he's at on his high... Yeah, like uh, the fir- uh, like I don't know what your algorithm's going to bring in, but when I typed in Stevie Ray Vaughan interview, the first one was him just it looked like he was uh coming down really hard, barely opening his eyes, trying to stay cool. I think he said something at the v- very funny at the top of top of it mm-hmm. and then just fell off, like started mm-hmm. going to bed. And then other times he's psyched, and then other times he's like the personality just changes a bunch on him, but overall, nice guy. Anyway, April 1985, Stevie went to the Astrodome to play the Star Spangled Banner for opening day. It started off great, but he forgot how it went halfway through. No, <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> Pretty embarrassing. Yeah. Now, like I said, for ent- his entire life, Stevie didn't have any money. A check would come in from record sales or show guarantees, and just like that, the money was gone. Which was gone, it just turns into cocaine. Well, it's gone because, look, man, I have more gone money than I have money, so I get it. Okay. Um, Which was made worse by the fact that he never paid taxes or even tried to file. Hmm. Their rock star attitudes, amongst Double Trouble, put them in a a burnout position where they needed to keep playing shows to pay back these huge debts and fulfill other contractual agreements. This wore down Stevie a whole lot and almost pushed the smart one, Chris Layton, out of the band. Mm. He did end up staying, but they had a lot of talks, and they needed Chris because he hit the snare nice, as Travis pointed out. Yeah, real nice. They're probably like... Yo, Chris, I don't even know what's happening, man. Do you know what's happening, dude? What's happening? And Chris is like, I, I know how to hit this. I'm going to leave. <laughs> I'm going to hit this. <laughs> man. Uh, the drugs were getting much worse. Uh-huh. And that was having effect on the, his performance. This is the first time. Usually he'd be able to get high as a kite and just fucking shred, have a good time up yeah. there on stage, get into his blues. But now... The performance was starting to suck. What once were soulful blues sessions turned into obnoxious noise jams, much like the live musical stylings of Williamsburg, Brooklyn, today. I don't, oh, Williamsburg. Oh, fancy. Yes. I thought that would go over better with you, Travis. <sighs> See, I was thinking, my head's always just that Dave Matthews with that noise. And like where fishy boys. Uh, I guess. I don't know. I'm just making fun of... I uh, love people. making fun of Williamsburg. Oh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, the band was known for their great live shows, and now they were unable to perform consistently. Tommy and Stevie were too strung out. Oh. Tommy's the criminal bassist, just a reminder. Yes. Uh, they had recorded a new live album called Live Alive, 
that was basically <laughs> not really live because the performances were, were so bad at the shows that they went through the multi-tape and started doing dub tracks over every single part. Oh, good. <laughs> oh, so, yeah. So this was just a not good product that they spent way more money than they needed to on, <laughs> and they didn't really have this money. Mm. Now, remember how I said he had a thing for shitty cocaine? Yeah. Yes. Well, in about 19... Oh, I forgot to write that. I, I, I'm going to say around 1986, his nose basically stopped working. Oh, Couldn't no. really get much in there. Dude, I love when you can't get the air up your nose. You like that? Yeah, that's one of my favorite that's, times. That's like, why I sound like this on this podcast. No, no, and no. And it's not no, from no, cocaine. No, 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 no. You go to on a water slide, you get the water up your nose, you're having a good time. I can't breathe out of my nose. Wow, that's... <laughs> you like being waterboarded is what I just heard. Nah, Can we do that to just you? go and have a fun time at the water park and water goes up my nose. Well, he couldn't get his cocaine up his nose. That's a problem. So to make sure he could get high, he'd pour a full glass of Crown Royale and dissolve a gram of cocaine in, into it and then toss it back extra quick. Oh, that sounds no. s- great. Yeah. Sounds yeah. great time, Stevie. Great time, Stevie. Now, this got him <laughs> high, but it also destroyed his stomach. Lots of thrown up blood, all the fun shit. Oh, yeah. yeah. And also, Stevie and Lenny's relationship was sucking hard now. Lenny was one of those women who just wanted to control Stevie because she's a woman. Uh, (laughs) She'd she'd break his records and scream at him for hours on end like a meth head banshee. I (laughs) didn't realize she was still around. Yeah, they were married for about six and a half years. Um, They were separated for about... To, yeah, I guess they were they were married and kind of respectful to each other for four years, and then the last two and a half years they were essentially separated. That's called a meth marriage. Yeah, um, numbers could be a little off there. But yeah, well, Stevie I mean, had, uh, Stevie had on... other love interests, and yeah. it was common knowledge. There's a lot of variables with a meth marriage. I mean, how many yeah, grams do you have? How many? How much speed do you do? How many body mass index? Body mass index. You mm-hmm. know, bingo. Yes, this is all very true. So is your home September, mobile? <laughs> That's a big question because if you can just leave, you can go to where the meth is. Yeah, you can go to where the meth is. That relationship might end a little. I should open up a like marriage no, console a service idea. service for just meth heads. Yeah, you should. What, yeah, what do you because call it? you can't you can't do it wrong. Meth matrimony. If you tell them if you tell them what they want to hear, then you're good. Yeah, if you tell them what they don't want to hear. They're going to flip a desk and leave, <laughs> and then you can collect on insurance. That's why I have sugar packets in my office, because they also like sugar. Meth heads like sugar? Yeah, I thought, No, fun. we just talked about this with Rob Ford. It's heroin addicts like the sugar. I know. Meth heads, meth heads like cigarettes and having soft dick sex. Yeah, okay, meth so I'm like open up uh, meth matrimony and meth mammograms. If anyone's interested... Uh, mm-hmm. You know, meth mammograms. Meth mammograms. Is, is, he said that, yeah. right, Tom? I got. Yeah, he did. Okay, Travis, <laughs> you should open up a service for meth heads where you can count their teeth without them opening their mouth. <laughs> that sir, you say, that sir is zero. No, <laughs> I was gonna say that's like that's like I don't know if that's possible. I think that's like a psychic because you just oh. don't know. It might have one, might have seven. They definitely don't have anywhere close to how many do we not, have? Uh, they're not over more 10. Than nine. Never more than nine. You, never more than nine, yes. Uh, all right, anyway. In September of 1986, Stevie and Double Trouble went on a European tour. Ah. This was a bad tour. Ah. Some of the worst performances the band ever played. And the keyboard player that they had hired walked off stage during their Paris show. Hmm. <laughs> Okay. While in Germany, he got sick after a show. He, uh, Stevie, got sick after a show, throwing up blood okay. everywhere, and was rushed to a hospital. Uh. Why is he throwing up blood? Is it, well, is it the cocaine? The cocaine. Or is it the crown cocaine oil? And, oh, it's both, man. You mix those two together, you got a fucking, you got a fucking, I don't even know what to call that, really. Colombian I, can, c- Canuck. Colombian Canuck. Oh, okay. None of this matters. Um, no. He was suffering from near-death hydration, which I didn't know was a thing. Oh, okay, cool. That's an actual medical term. It's not just, like, very dehydrated. It's near-death hydration. Wow. 
They treated him and sent him off to his next show. After that, he was checked into rehab in London, and his doctor, Dr. Bloom, who came recommended by Eric Clapton himself, oh. told him that he had a month a month to live if he didn't knock all the drugs and boozing out. Yeah, doctors, what do they know? Yeah, right? He, uh, he spent a couple days there and then played a show in London where he fell off stage. <laughs> the mm-hmm. band canceled the next 13 days of the tour, and Stevie checked into rehab in Atlanta and cleaned himself up and stayed there for a while. Keep in mind, this dude has been drinking since he was six yeah, on the lot. daily. Since about the age of 14, he has not had a sober day. Ooh. Yeah, that's going to be a uh, withdrawal, I was going to say. Yeah. Uh, but also, you go to Atlanta, and you just get that Waffle House, and you're all good. Oh, I love Waffle House so much. Dude. Yeah, dude. I'm just saying. It's... Yep. It's true. So, after rehab, Stevie's out. He's feeling good. Um, so, that, it's time to write an album. So for the album yeah. In Step, Stevie experienced the first time recording without being totally fucked. It took some getting used to, but eventually he was on top of it and playing guitar better than ever. Oh, His wow. biggest problem in the studio was his hero, Albert King. Now, he was brought into the studio to help work on the album as a consult, and just because they had somewhat of a repertoire at this point. And he'd spend time at the studio. He'd kind of like help him out with their songs. If he heard something that he didn't like that the band was playing, he'd bust into the live room and destroy the take. He'd use the callback mic in the middle of them playing, <laughs> which also destroys the take, and yeah. made Stevie's life a living hell. Hey, guess why you idiots? You're doing it wrong, you stupid fuckers. Oh, way to yeah. ruin a take, Travis. Thank you. Yeah. He's like a, a blues Don Vito. <laughs> um, oh, no. He asked Stevie to borrow $3,000 and the next week when Stevie asked for it back, King played dumb and acted like he didn't know what he was talking about. When King was later confronted by Stevie about it, Albert King told him, you owe me, man. Ah. This was, this was Albert King going, hey, you stole my style. What dick? Yeah. Uh, so Albert King's a penis. Yes. Uh, the album sold very well and is considered some of his greatest work. Uh, All while Stevie was sober and happy. Life was great for Stevie and the other guys. They all sobered up. They were operating as a family unit, and everyone was clean. They weren't even smoking cigarettes. Isn't that weird? Oh, that yeah. is weird, dude. I can't what imagine is, What's that. wrong with you? Wait, are they, do they turn into Christians? No. <laughs> okay. Not at all. I like how that's I just immediately to make where sure. your head goes. I just want to make sure. It's like, Yo, know, quitting drinking and smoking and stopping cigarettes is a symptom of Christian conversion. <laughs> yeah, Be that's very true. Yeah. Check the pulse. Yes. Uh, Stevie and Double Trouble were touring and loving every minute of it. They were all healthier. They were happier. His older brother, Jimmy, and his band, the Thunderbirds, joined Double Trouble for a few tours, and they even decided to record an album together called Family Style. Family uh, Style? Yes. Oh, my God. Hey, uh, Stevie. What up, bro? Nice shred you got going on, man. Here's some fucking wheatgrass. Yeah. Yeah, I see them all wearing sweaters. <laughs> yeah, right? You know it, I mean? like, it was the album cover them for like a Sears photo shoot. Yeah, actually, that'd be cool. <laughs> Let me actually look that up right now. Family style. What is the album cover for this? Oh, it's not very good. They're both wearing... Uh, loose-fitting suits and holding their Stratocasters, looking at the camera, smiling. Oh. I need to see it now. Yeah, put it in the put that in the chat. I wanna I wanna gaze oh. upon these this this Penn and Teller of a. It's um, I would say that the album cover, like I said, kind of looks like Penn and Teller, but if they were a little bit more yeah, gyp- you were but, but a little bit more gypsy, like gypsy, yeah, Penn, gypsy and Penn and Teller, yeah, that are showing off guitars. In, in not the right posture, you're supposed to hold a guitar. No. No, not no. at all. No, that's not the concern. It's just looking like you're kicking back with your bro. That's what it's all about. I also, also, the typography is great. We've got distressed uh, sands yeah. on the sides that say Brothers Vaughn. And then we've got family in like Helvetica and then like some distressed Block like. Helvetica. Yeah. And then, and then style is in like one of those like, like, uh, uh, Papyrus? Almost. Yeah, no, it, it's like Ed Hardy-ish. 
It's like very yeah. frilly, like and and cursive and stupid. Wow, Ed Hardy, Ed Hardy, twice in one episode. Yeah, you are. I gotta wash my hands. <sighs> yeah, right. He is sober. He is writing good albums. He is performing fantastically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like 1990, now, right? Around 1990. Now, ask me how he died. How'd this boy die, Thomas? Like a lot of people who struggle with drugs and alcohol throughout their life. Even if they found happiness and sobriety and have moved away from the negative mental and physical damages of oh, drug man. and alcohol, they meet a similar fate, which is dying in a terrible and fiery helicopter accident. <laughs> oh, no! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this Let's this whole it. episode has just been that joke waiting. <laughs> yeah, it's a good build-up. So, uh... Why is he in a helicopter? All right. So on Monday, August 27th, 1990, Stevie was playing an all-star jam session with his brother, Eric Clapton, Buddy Guy, and Robert Cray. People say that this is one of his best performances. Wow. Hmm. They just say that After because sh- that's his last performance. Oh, well, the best is always y- last. Y- there's actually a CD of it, and it's very good. I with know, the, but... The helicopter crash? Not the crash itself, but uh, okay. just before. Yeah, no, so but people... I'm, I'm just saying, though, it's like, oh, that was the best one he ever did. It's because the last uh, yeah. one. Of course. So after the show, Stevie and some of Eric Clapton's crew members boarded a helicopter to leave the venue in East Troy, Wisconsin. Oh, wow. As there's only one road to get into the place, and they needed to get these talents back and forth. There were several helicopters running all night. It was a normal service put together by Clapton. Right. The helicopter took off and crashed into a ski mountain shortly after, killing Stevie and the three other passengers that no one cared for as much. They were right. all- mountains are huge. They don't move. How did you not see it coming? There were some lawsuits about this. Well, it- also, I mean, you could say they were under the influence of apple juice. Very serious substance Terrible that we substance. drink. Yeah, yeah. That's not that serious. Anyway, <laughs> Vaughn was... Vaughn was buried in Laurel Land Cemetery in Dallas, Texas, August 31st, 1990. Wow. Mm. In 1992, his family filed a wrongful death lawsuit against wow. Omniflight Helicopters and was settled for an undisclosed amount in 1995. Oh, I hate that. It's just and like, how much? Oh, who? And that's no the end knows. of this relatively sad story, but also funny. Yeah. Because of the cocaine. Who was his family? Like was his Steve Ray Vaughn? His mom was still oh, alive. Okay. His dad had died four years prior. Jimmy has kids and stuff like that. Oh, okay. And I think that I, I'm pretty sure they were probably doing it on behalf of the Clapton people too. Right. Clapton want to get paid. Well, I mean, they Clapton. Money. Clapton lost three good crew members. Yeah, and that you know, it's hard to find a good talent in the industry. Flight yeah, flight boys, is. as I call them. Yeah, it's true. It's true. So uh, that's Stevie Ray Vaughan, one of the world's best guitar players. Was he yeah. ever too fucked up to play? Like, did we have mm. did you cover that? Or oh yeah, yeah. No, he did that several times right before he had to sober up. Oh, okay, that was probably his yellow flag, a red yeah. flag rather. He was fucking up all over the place. There were concerts where he would he would just be in the wrong scale because he was so fucked up. So it was always funny with him because he would fuck up in one way. Mm-hmm. But then be consistent in another. For example, um, if he was off on the timing, he was off like two beats. So he was just ahead or behind everyone else, but perfectly <laughs> like a machine. Or he was just he was hanging out on the wrong frets and staying in the wrong key and he couldn't hear the bass. Right. Uh, uh, yeah. So just, he was doing he, everything technically right, but he was off. Yeah, he was like he was shifted in a measurable way. In a methamphetamine way. So it's kind a of like muscle memory. memory. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, he's a great player, but, but he's a total goofball. You know, How old was he before he died? 35. Ooh, wow, that's so young. He, uh, yeah. Well, he outlived his life expectancy by, like, what, eight years? Yeah. 27 club? Oh, yeah, that's very true. I mean, his hero, <laughs> his hero was Jimi Hendrix. Yeah. Um, also, I forgot to mention, I don't know... I don't know if he went blackface on it, but in the book I read, they were talking about how one Halloween he played a show dressed as Jimi Hendrix. Yeah. It's, he, oh, he, he went, went blackface. Face. Come yeah. on. He, yeah. This is like 1981 or something. This is earlier than that. Okay. This is, yeah, this is like 77. Uh, he was Trudeau face that night. Yeah. Also, 
I th- my reference book for this was called Texas Flood. Um, it's a compilation of people's quotes, and it's the most annoying book in the world because it's just a bunch of people who were in the same room at the same time for most oh. of these events. So it's uh, let's say the author gets a quote from Chris Layton, and then yeah. he gets a quote from from Tommy, the bass player. And they're saying the same thing. Oh, so it's like Groundhog's oh. Day as you're reading. They're not idiots. They're goofballs, but they're not idiots. Right. So they're just, yeah, this is what happened there. It was crazy. And then the next guy goes, yeah, that's exactly what happened there. It was crazy. <laughs> it's like, why the fuck did I read the second one? Right. Just pick the better one. Yeah, that book could have been about 50 pages shorter. Interesting. Mm. Yeah, Texas Flood. You know what? Texas floods just as much as in New York. You might see Joseph Gordon Levitt riding a bike really fast what down the sidewalk. About? Yeah, okay. All right, you talk about Premium Rush, a he movie is. that doesn't. All right, here's a little paradox for you. What? Travis. Yeah, oh, tell me a paradox. What am I, vapid? I'm so, still using that word. <laughs> <laughs> now, Premium Rush is the best movie. Yeah. And The Mummy is the best movie. You can't have both. Which one is the best movie? You can't have both. All right, well, let me tell you. There are multiple universes. Let me open your mind a little bit. There are multiple right. universes. Thanks for listening to Roast Mortem <laughs> Podcast. You and know? in those universes, we can have different movies in the same universe. slash Roast But one is better than the other one. Yeah. We but also got one Twitter has and Brendan all that Frazier. stuff. And the other one has Joseph Gordon Levin. Both have sand. You have to look very closely in Premium Rush. There is sand. Yeah. Thanks. So, like Cody just said, <laughs> um, yeah, hit us up on Patreon. Give us a buck or two a month if you like the show. If you don't like the show, I don't know how you got this far. Yeah, yeah, it's impressive. So you like the for show? Admit it there. to yourself. You'll like it. You will. Yeah, Travis you're in denial. Travis, actually, I'm pretty proud of you because aside from ruining. One of my one of my bits with your mummy talk this evening. You didn't mention your dick even once. Oh shit! Is this like maybe a first? Yeah, I'm actually proud of you because I was I'm busy personally playing tired with of it hearing the whole about time. It. Yeah, well. I, I think I saw that. <laughs> Good thing I was reading. My penis is a there different is. thing. Have you ever played Tiddlywigs? That's great because my penis could do that. All it's right. Flat. Thanks a lot, it's everyone. Flat, and you can use quarters on it. I've seen you open a beer bottle with your penis. Yep. Look painful. All right, bye, everyone. All right, bye, dogs. Yeah. yeah. Guess bye. what? Look up tiddlywinks.com no, slash penisboys slash penis sons for a 21% discount on your dick.